is going to talk to us about how you can use video from CNN to analyze everyone's emotions <laughs> in this exciting constitutional crisis. <laughs> That's a good application, yes. <laughs> Thank you. So hi, everyone. My name is Laszlo Jani. I'm a project scientist here, and I'm going to talk about multi-model computational behavior understanding. Now, what is uh, behavior and emotion science? If you want, basically, we want to get uh, computers to read and understand human emotions, and also to make that information available in real time so technology and devices can uh, use that information to make decisions. So if you think about human intelligence, it's not about just uh, about your IQ, your cognitive intelligence. It, it's also about your emotional intelligence, your EQ. And if you think about it, people with higher EQ tend to be more persuasive, more likable, more successful in their personal and professional life. And that can be true for AI as well. Now, if I give you this image, what do you see? Are these people are having a good time or they are having an argument? Good time. Good time. Why is that? She's actually terrified. <laughs> <laughs> so you can tell facial expressions. They are smiling. You can tell forward posture, interpersonal distance. They are uh, holding open gesture. They are holding a mutual gaze. The question is, how did you learn these skills? Can you answer that? The question is, you didn't learn it in a textbook. Uh, it's about uh, intersubjectivity. This is a really nice uh, experiment from Meltsov. So this is a newborn baby, two to three weeks old. When an experimenter sticks out his tongue, the baby sticks out his tongue. When he opens his mouth, the baby opens his mouth. Uh, we are born with the ability to acquire an in incredible, uh, sophisticated set of social reasoning tools. Uh, and infants are born with this capability uh, for intersubjectivity, for sharing experiences and feelings with other people. Uh, basically, they are imitating other people. Uh, and if you think about it, this knowledge is uh, outside of our awareness, so we are not aware. Um, how we make this decision. So for example, if, you, if I ask you to recall your best friend's face and describe how you recognize him or her. So first, probably you will make a list. OK, she has brown hair, brown eyes. But a lot of other people have brown hair and brown eyes. So you can make other stories that maybe her has her mother knows. But the answer is they really look themselves. So we rely on features that we don't have conscious access to. What kind of applications could we use this uh, technology for we grant a machine? <coughs> There's a couple of applications that I uh, worked in the past. <coughs> uh, one of them is, for example, advertising research. Uh, when companies want to understand if they are emotionally engaging their consumers with their advertisements. Another big uh, uh, application domain is mental health, quantifying mental health. If you think about it, if you walk uh, into your doctor's office today, does your doctor ask you what your blood pressure is, what your temperature is? No. They just measure it. However, in mental health, the gold standard is still self-report on a scale from 1 to 10. How depressed are you? Or how much pain are you feeling? <clears throat> uh, also, you can use this technology in intelligent tutors. So you can optimize individual learning trajectories. Uh, you can estimate motivations, cognitive capabilities, and they are predictive sign of success and understanding of test requirements. Uh, another application is assistive systems, uh, where you want to provide this information to people who are maybe on a autism spectrum, who don't have social skills, or they are not as good as we are, or people uh, with physical disabilities. So I'd like to show you a quick peek uh, demo how this technique works uh, in assistive systems. Let me just increase the volume here. So 
So she's Chiaku, Chieko Asakawa. She's an IBM fellow here. She's wearing a head-mounted camera that records and processes whatever is her visual field. Uh, and she's uh, blind. And the system will transform that visual information to voice. Let's see. Oops. <coughs> Nick is approaching. Looks so happy. Oh, hi, Nick. Hey, Jacob. Uh, where are you going? You look so happy. Oh, well, my <coughs> just got accepted. Oh, that's great. Congratulations. Thanks. Wait, uh, how'd you know it was me and that I look happy? Hi. <laughs> <coughs> uh, hi. He is not talking to you, but on his phone. <laughs> so that was the. Introduction, if you want to build a system like this, what kind of components do we need? You need three components. First, you need registration. You want to find where the person or the face of a person is on the image, and you want to track it over time. And when you have that information, you can use it for analysis and also for synthesis. But these three components are really not a linear uh, dependencies, but uh, more like interacting with each, each other. So you can use synthesis to improve registration, or you can use the same thing to improve analysis. You can synthesize more data uh, to certain domains that uh, your data set does not cover. So let's go through all of these uh, components. <coughs> Which one? The demo. Was it yeah. real? Yes, yeah. yes. That works in real time. No, no. And it was not done Wizard of Oz. No. Because the system recognizes the, these emotions and uh, it can transform it to voice. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So let's start with registration. So registration is important for a system. We need noise-free and desirably real-time method that can track uh, human uh, movement because we are really interested in the quality of movement. So what is tracking? What does tracking mean? Uh, we want to measure movement over time. So certain uh, from uh, time one to time two, where does uh, facial parts move? So for example, these are the eye movement. We can track the face. But if you think about it, if you want to solve this as a point-based manner, it might fail, because so many parts on a face or on a body part are are similar. You need to constrain the problem. You need a model-based solution. Uh, there are many uh, solutions were proposed in the past. There are 2D approaches that can measure 2D movement from a, a video image. And there are also 3D methods that can also estimate the 3D structure of a face of a body. <coughs> uh, I want to describe my work on 3D face registration. This method takes a single 2D image of a person's face and registers a 3D shape in real time for each frame. This uh, algorithm uses a, what we call a cascade regressor. This is a very fast linear regressor method <coughs> uh, because no assumptions are required about illuminations and other surface properties. This can work in real, real world environments. Now, if you think about it, what's the problem between 2D and 3D registration? Uh, is, uh, is really if you have an image that you annotate in 2D, those points won't correspond to the same points if you rotate the image. So you really need to annotate a 3D mesh instead of a 2D image. So that's what I did. Uh, I used a 77 point annotation on a 3D mesh. Uh, and if you rotate that mesh, you can see that the points are holding correspondence over different uh, viewpoints. Also, to acquire a really dense uh, registration, a really dense mesh, we can use a surface tessellation. <coughs> so starting from the original 77 point, you can densify this annotation to get 500, 1,000, or even more markers uh, that are in semantic correspondence across subject and across expressions. And when you have this kind of uh, annotation, <coughs> you can generate training data. So you are not uh, restricted to use only frontal images. You can synthesize them to any direction and any orientation you want and use that for uh, training purposes. I like to show you the whole alignment process. <coughs> so the method takes a single 2D image. 
and uh, I use the phase detector, Viola Jones, just find the phase, and it starts with the initial guess of the markers. This is a frontal looking uh, uh, template, and at around each marker, you extract a certain feature descriptor. It can be a hook feature. In my case, it was a binary feature, and you learn a linear mapping from that marker uh, to the ground truth location. And after iterating this process, it can converge within four steps. If there are some noise, you can alleviate it with begging, and you can register a very dense 3D mesh on this 2D uh, annotation, so you will get a 3D structure of the face. So this is a reconstructed 3D structure <coughs> that you can be used for analysis. Of course, uh, you can pull the texture from the original image, and you can use it for synthesis. So you can synthesize novel views that haven't been seen before. There's a couple of uh, tracking examples. So this tracker uses more than 1,000 markers on the face. This is a markerless tracking, by the way, so it uses only a 2D image. <coughs> so let's just skip this. <coughs> so the tracker itself is robust to head orientation, uh, works in real time. It will, it's also robust to small occlusions. And if it loses tracking, it can reinitialize itself. So it's a whole cycle. Now, if you want to look at the precision of this uh, method, uh, I validated this method on different data sets. So basically, if you think about it, it provides three different modalities. It provides facial expressions in, in the form of uh, landmarks. It also provides a 3D head pose, and also can provide a 3D eye gaze. <coughs> So I uh, validated the 2D and 3D landmark estimation on two different data sets. That was MultiPy that was developed here uh, more than 10 years ago. And also on a synthetic data set using uh, 3D meshes that were <coughs> synthesized into different orientations. Uh, I compared it with different methods like CLMs or uh, really uh, fast binary regressors. And it achieves the best uh, ground truth per, uh, performance on these data sets. I also validated the head pose uh, estimation on a Boston head pose data set. That's a, a bit older data set. It uh, contains ground truth head orientation using a magnetic sensor. So the subject is wearing a magnetic flock of bird sensor on his head. That provides the ground truth 3D information. <coughs> and the tracker estimates pitch, hue, and roll angles of the head in a camera coordinate system. Uh, and you can see that uh, the, my work uh, gets the best uh, pitch recognition. Overall, it's a second best one. Only Jaws at all tracker beats uh, in, a, in a mean uh, performance, but that's a cylinder tracker. So basically, that doesn't uh, provide facial deformation. That provides only a, a head orientation. Sure. <laughs> it fails when uh, it's, uh, there's a really big occlusion. So, for example, if uh, half of the face is missing. I mean, you showed the hook going up and down, and it's green, right? That's yes, yes. So, for example, it, it cannot uh, track currently if it's more than a profile uh, view orientation. So, it can pr track profile to profile view, but it cannot track more than that. Sometimes it also has problem if. Uh, there's a very unique face that uh, wasn't in a training set. So for example, people with craniofacial deformities, uh, the model never saw those kind of faces. So presumably, it would <coughs> not do well on cubist paintings. Like That's <laughs> true. Space where the eyes are like that. There goes the practical applications. Yes. Uh, also has some problems with small infants because their face is very different. They have chubby cheeks, and uh, their eyebrows are not very pronounced. So it can fail on uh, images like that. With an eye patch? There was a recent controversy about that on SNL. <laughs> so if the occlusion is small, the, it will work. I mean, you saw it, will, it worked with the. Uh, that's a good question. It's an open question to test. Yeah. 
That's true. Uh, I, I wondered, well, I wonder what would happen if there were mirrors. But um, when we saw the eyes there, was it, uh, was the vision seeing the eyes through the glasses, or was that just inferred from the uh, interpolation of the model? That was inferred. So as long as you can track a large portion of the face, you can infer the rest of the part of the face. The face has, has very specific structures. It's a very structured object. You can infer in structure from the parts. And do you have to have seen the face without glasses? Uh, the training set consisted only faces without glasses. So, so as you're turning your head, uh, the, what you can see, and let's just focus now on how long my nose is. Mm -hmm. There's two ways to do the fitting. One is what you described, frame by frame. Uh, and of course, this way you are discarding 3D information from the previous frame. Or you can constrain uh, fitting over the whole video sequence, and that gives you a better and more precise tracking. It's a bit slower. So that uh, also provides uh, I guess the I guess precision is around three to four degrees from approximately a meter away from the uh, screen. So what are the open challenges here? So one of them is <coughs> uh, how to take this uh, method out to the wild in the wild conditions. So to answer this question, uh, I organized a challenge, a 3D face alignment in the wild challenge at ECCV. <coughs> And the question is, I wanted to use three different data sets. One of them was synthetic data that was from the BP4D data set. Uh, this data set comes with uh, 2D images plus 3D modalities, you, so you can uh, synthesize images to different orientations, different backgrounds. Of course, this is a synthetic data. Uh, so I really wanted to include something valid, uh, something lab conditions. Uh, and these images are from MultiPy. This was collected here more than 10 years ago. This data set was collected to answer questions for different head orientations, different uh, uh, illuminations. I used a structure from motion technique to reconstruct the whole data set in 3D. And uh, that's how we get the 3D annotation for. But really, the most important uh, subset is in the wild conditions. But how do you collect in the wild images, in the wild 3D annotated images? And the answer is really uh, from the Matrix movie. You probably you remember what technology was used in this. It's called bullet time or time slide vi uh, videos, where they are placing a camera array around the scene. They are synchronously reco uh, recording the whole scene. And then you can replay uh, the whole scene from different viewpoints. Now, the interesting thing is people are already collecting this kind of data and uploading it to YouTube. There are various conditions. Uh, they are recording on golf courses, under water. So you don't really need to uh, collect data. You can just go to YouTube, download it, and annotate it. So the, that's the three subsets uh, that I use for the challenge. Synthetic data in the lab conditions and in the wild conditions. It's more than 20,000 images. <coughs> Uh, these images were annotated in a consistent uh, 3D annotation. What does that mean? So if you annotate an image from the front and from the sides, you can just overlay the 3D annotation in a canonical coordinate system, and they uh, perfectly fit each other. And that was one of the uh, goal of the challenge. If you annotate, if you uh, register an image from a frontal position, estimate the structure from the frontal position. Uh, is it true for the side positions as well? So can you get the same structure from a, sim a single image? To answer this question, I use two uh, ground truth metrics. One of the first metric is a ground truth error, that basically it's a landmark error in the image coordinate system. And the other error is a cross view consistency error. Basically, you reconstruct a phrase uh, from one image and project that to another uh, orientation and calculate the differences between the 3D meshes. Uh, sure. Clarification. These are three images taken simultaneously from different angles, right? This is not that's one true. person uh, moving their face. Yes, that's a multi-view image. 
And the goal was to annotate them separately, so you don't have access to all three. You have access uh, uh, only one at a time. Okay. So if you think about it, if you do it uh, frame by frame level, <coughs> uh, you can get very good uh, ground truth consistency, but uh, you might won't get a really good cross view consistency. But if you, for example, take a mean face, average over a population, you fit that to these three images, you might get really bad uh, ground truth consistency, but you will get perfect cross view consistency because basically you are just rotating the same template to different orientations. Uh, eight teams accepted the challenge and submitted test result. <coughs> uh, I report only the first four. <coughs> uh, so the, the interesting things I want just to point out, the first two is a deep learning maze method. However, the third one is a cascade regressor. It has a very important uh, implication since the performances are very similar. So for example, uh, if you see the ground truth uh, consistency, one unit in that means one pixel error in all the landmarks. So all of these methods are very good. However, the cascade regressors can operate much faster than the deep learning based methods. So what is the takeaway message? Deep CNNs wins in precision, but cascade regressor win in speed. These can operate over 1,000 uh, frames per sec, and uh, you can get nearly, nearly the same um, alignment result. And if you think about it, what is real-time uh, performance today? We used to think that it's 25 FPS, 35 uh, FPS, but your iPhone can record over 200 FPS. If your method doesn't operate in that domain, you are losing out a lot. Is that really true? I mean, your I think so. is a mechanical system, and your neck muscles are only so strong, mm -hmm. and your facial expressive <coughs> muscles are only so strong, and you know, some of us have fat faces, a lot of mass. There are mechanical time constants that, you know, if I was talking arms and legs, I'd say 100 hertz or less would be just fine. Mm -hmm. You're That's not true. Really missing anything. How fast can you move your head and your face? Uh, it would be also like 100 FPS. I would not use more than that for face analysis. Uh, eye movements can be really fast. Seconds uh, are really fast. Uh, but if you think about the technology, I mean, you can put this technology on a cell phone, and uh, you can use for all kind of high-speed recording applications and processing. Right. But there's a fundamental trade-off. The faster you sample, the more photons you need. Uh, so your performance goes way down in low light conditions, and you know you have thermal issues if you're blasting a flashlight or whatever illumination mm -hmm. you might want to add to the scene. That's true, but you will get less motion blur with a high-speed video, and that's uh, that's Ooh, important. Can we separate out the shutter speed and you know? Yes, you can do that. But you have the possibility to use this technology in that domain. Uh, did you already, or will you uh, teach us what cascade regressors are, or were we supposed to do that as a homework? That was the homework. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe at the end. So it's, uh, I, I think your notes just got longer. Oh, incredible. <laughs> in real time. But yes. So basically, the cascade regressors are just a cascade of linear regressors. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, you extract features along landmarks. So for example, you start with the initial guess, where the eyes are, where the nose are. You extract a feature, like a hook feature. And you want to learn a linear mapping from that feature space to a displacement, which place you have to move the landmark to, to its grand truth location. So basically, it's uh, very similar to how uh, like uh, Lucas Canada works or active appearance model works. Instead of calculating the Hessian and the uh, Hessian matrix, you can just learn that matrix. So basically, you are learning this linear mapping. Yes, you can control that. So is that what you cannot do with deep learning? 
Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's a deep learning methods usually work very slow on a cell phone, for example, but a cascade regressor can over work with 100, uh, 300 FPS. <coughs> Uh, and after you find a face and track it, what can you do with it? You can do analysis. So for registration, we have a really precise uh, registration, noise-free. And if you take one modality, the human face, how do you measure facial actions? <coughs> there are different methods. Uh, one of them is facial electromyography or facial EMG. Or you can use uh, observational me uh, measurement called the facial action coding system. Both of them has uh, advantages and disadvantages. So if you think about it, the uh, facial EMG, the electrode on the face, can see really unseen movements. They detect electri electrical potential of muscle movements. Uh, this movement can be very tiny. Uh, they are more sensitive uh, to the more uh, subtle uh, movements, and the latency is really small. However, they are integrating electrical potential over a surface area. So they are not very good with uh, specificity. So for example, if you want to get uh, lip corneal movements, it cannot differentiate between a smile or a smirk. So uh, you can put more electrodes on the face, but it's really obtru uh, uh, obtrusive. So you feel that something is on your face, it will inhibit movement. The other uh, one more method is uh, using needle electrodes that can be localized, but uh, they, are, they can be quite painful to uh, install them on the face. Are you saying the area over which they're integrating is uh, bigger than the diameter of those white dots there? Yes, I mean, they are collecting potential from more. Uh, okay. So you can localize the movement, uh, the muscles, with a needle electrode, but it's, uh, it's more painful to uh, apply that. Uh, so you really need a method that is, uh, uh, does not inhibit movements, and that's an observational method. It's called facial action unit coding system. <coughs> if you think about it, you have like 40 muscles on your face. Each of them can cause uh, a different uh, visual deformation on the face, like a different bulge, different wrinkles. This is an anatomically oriented system. <coughs> uh, some of the muscles gives more than one um, action units. So for example, uh, action unit 12, that's a lip corneal puller. There's the zygomatic mu muscles pulls the lip corneals uh, up and sidewards. Uh, but for example, the dimpler action unit six, uh, 14, that's the buccinator muscle that pulls it sideways. So for example, with facial EMJ, you cannot uh, differentiate between these two muscles. They are just too close to each other, but they are uh, causing a very different visual effect. So you can measure it if you want to, so uh, it, after you measure all the uh, action units, you can combine them and you can get an interpretation. So this is a sign-based system. It doesn't tell you anything about the emotional state of, of the face, uh, but you can combine them to describe a certain uh, emotional expression, happiness, or for example, fear in this case. You can describe intensity of pain. So if you can uh, measure certain action units, if they are present with this intensity, you can infer a level of pain. So the upper left, what, what do the letters mean? Uh, the letters means uh, uh, that's the intensity. So each and every action has a five uh, point scale from trace level to extreme, A right. to uh, E. There's a big problem with uh, a manual fax coding. <clears throat> it's really reliable and uh, valid. However, if you have like a two and a half minute video, you will uh, need more than four hours of coding time. So that's one of our uh, expert coder. He's sitting in front of a video and he's going through frame by frame uh, of the video and annotates every action. So we really need an automated system to do this if we want to be effective. To build such system, uh, I use the data set. This is a, three, a BP4D uh, data set. It comes with different modalities. It comes with uh, 2D images, 3D modalities. You can see the texture mapped images on the top. And we fax coded the whole data set with uh, a set of uh, action units. <coughs> uh, and this is a spontaneous data set. So for example, what the sequence that you see here is a elicitation of pain. So the participant had to keep his hand in a bucket of cold water. 
that's how we elicit that pain. When he withdrew his uh, hand, the, uh, the experimenter scolded him. That's how he uh, elicited anger. There was one task, for example, when uh, they threw a dart to a, ta a dart table next to his head <laughs> uh, to get fear. And of course, uh, we got IRB approval for this. I hope you paid them well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so if you three set of darts. Even then, you have a high risk of your subjects giving you fake expressions. Uh, not really. That's uh, elicited. Do they know that their face is being recorded for that purpose? Yeah, that's the only thing that they know. I'd be overacting. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're welcome to join for the next data collection. <laughs> no, I, I, this is a serious issue. I mean, we all know that fake smiles that's are true. very different from real smiles. And if you, in the end, train your system to recognize fake smiles as smiles, you sort of screwed yourself. That's true. Did you do it like 10 times, and by the 10th time, they're not faking or they're not seeing it? They're but by the 10th time, of course you'd be faking. You think so? I don't know. Maybe it's not <coughs> You wouldn't be fear. You wouldn't have fear. Well, that's or the best that we could fear. elicit. So each participant went through each task once, only once. So we don't have more data from the same person. So that can be a limitation. There's one more thing that's important. So one of them is the appearance, for example, how fear expression look like. And the other is the dynamic. So when you are faking it, I mean, that's really you're different. What using here is you're just looking at facial muscles. You're not looking at the eyes, for example. The eyes but, I'm, but I mean the dynamics over time. So for well, example. Let, let's talk about that. The, the, the facial units, as originally developed, are measures of where the external <coughs> skin is, yeah. and include the eyes, right? Eye movements, yes, looking up, down. I mean, no, but I think that that's the subtle variations. But I mean, one of the things is that if you have a fake smile, you can tell by looking at the eye. You can tell by. At least I, I can see that if this guy is faking mm -hmm. it or not. Yeah, that's what we call the Duchenne marker, the contraction of the splinter muscles around the eyes. It causes the wrinkles around the eyes, so that's what probably you are looking at. Uh, I could uh, do that and still fake it, right? It's not it's just the eye position and where they're looking. Mm -hmm. You could be looking somewhere else, right? Well, the goal of this data set was to call like this uh, elicited um, expressions. I'm just trying to see what, <coughs> I mean, what the, the kind of accuracy that you would need. Let's say I wanted to detect whether a person is method acting or real. That would be very hard to do. You can tell from the dynamics of how the, uh, so for example, if you are showing a, a, a fake smile, usually the amplitude is really high, and then there's a, a small f fall off factor. A spontaneous smiles are much more uh, prolonged with multiple uh, peaks, for example, in intensity. So why aren't your facial coding units space time rather than just, you know, at each instant you look at a frame? Oh, you can do the same thing over a video. So it provides the binary occurrence of a facial action and their intensity on a five-point scale. So for example, yeah, I would argue the essence of some <coughs> gestures is only the dynamics. The you know, position is secondary. For example, the the gesture where you sort of say, "I'm uh, <coughs> you off." It's all about that, that about that movement. Mm -hmm. So why don't the units themselves? Why aren't they space time? I mean, you can interpret that that way if you have access to each video frames. facial expression, which is physical and is described by the AUs, from the emotion that we think, that we interpret as reflecting, which can be uh, varied by culture and context and a bunch of other things. So in your experiment, the only reason for the powerful stimuli was to elicit particular facial 
units don't, don't normally occur. Like exactly. Uh, like <laughs> that. But once we listed them, which you're only doing to get variability in the data set, you could throw it away because all you care about <coughs> is um, getting enough data to train the detector each uh, facial action. Right, right. So basically, we want to uh, train a detector that can do the coding for us. Mm -hmm. So that's the uh, main goal here. So if you look at the different parts of the system, uh, you start from an original image, you do the uh, 3D tracking, you normalize the image to a canonical coordinate system, and uh, currently we are using a, a, a deep CNN method. I compared two methods here, a single and a multi-label uh, solution, <coughs> and uh, predicting uh, labels were the facial action units. It was a relatively small network. Uh, I tried two configurations, five and seven layers. Uh, the input image was normalized to 256 by 256, and uh, the loss function basically was working on single label or multi label uh, <coughs> prediction. And if we compare it with uh, other methods, so you can see the different action units. This uh, data set comes with uh, a set of 10 uh, action units, or I'm just showing nine here. These are different methods. Some of them are deep learning based methods, some of them are uh, simple uh, SVM, like the first one. <coughs> and you can see that both methods, uh, the multi-label prediction uh, gets approximately similar performance as uh, the state of the art. What's the metric here? Correlation? It's not error rate. Uh, that's F1 score. That's uh, uh, missing okay. from this uh, table. Yes, that's okay. a good point. Big numbers are good. <laughs> so higher the number, the better. <laughs> uh, but if uh, I run it in a single label manner, uh, that gives a much better result on a uh, on the whole data set. And of course, if you think about it, this is only a, a frontal data set, so it's a relatively easy task. So what I did, I uh, synthesized different orientations and looked into the performance degradation. So what you can see, I synthesized uh, the data set into five different views, from frontal to extreme your rotation. What you can see here, uh, the bars are color-coded, uh, they show the uh, different orientations. But you can see that uh, certain action units, the prediction is very consistent. And for others, there are some variation like action unit uh, 23. And uh, another point to point out here is uh, the different performance. Uh, the, the performance was measured with F1 score and that's uh, augmented by the skew in the data set. So for example, we have much more smiles samples than, for example, eyebrow movements. Uh, but you can compare them across the different poses. And if you synthesize the data to pitch rotations, different pitch rotations, you can see the same pattern. So the uh, predictor is relatively robust to pose and orientations. Another question that uh, you can ask is, what do the classifiers see here, right? Do they see the real action? Uh, so to visualize this, I created an occlusion sensitivity map. Basically, I took an original image, I occluded a small portion of the image randomly, uh, and looked into the performance degradation over this uh, occlusion. And if you integrate the whole image, you, you can see which portion of the image is more, most important for the prediction. So you can see that for eyebrow movements, the system gets most of the uh, movement. It's very interesting, the actual unit six, that's uh, what we call a smile intensifier. That's a Duchenne marker. So if you display a really big smile, our actual unit six is uh, also displayed. So this, is, uh, this information is strongly correlated and the classifier picks up the lip movements instead of the eye movements. And just to show a video how the whole system works, we take the original video, uh, we track it, feed it to the system, and what you can see is the green bars are the ground truth uh, labels that a human annotator annotated. Uh, the red lines are uh, prediction probabilities. When they are over the center line, uh, that's where the action unit is present. That shows the uh, red bar. 
So you can see that we get most of the action units really precisely. We miss a couple of actions. Now there's a couple of interesting uh, questions here to answer. Uh, one of them is uh, intensity. How small movements can we detect? And the other is head orientation. Until how far can we go with uh, uh, synthesis? So in order to answer this, I organized, I co-organized the facial expression <coughs> recognition challenge at FG. Uh, most of the systems uh, currently still using a binary. Uh, labels for these actual units and also they are limited to frontal poses. So in order to uh, create a challenge data, I use the BP4D dataset. This is a BP4D plus dataset. That's the extension of the previously collected data. This also contains thermal images, uh, different biosensors like respiration and heart rate. Uh, but the interesting thing that we are using the texture plus the 3D information to synthesize uh, these images to different orientations. I created uh, eight, uh, nine orientation that consists of uh, U and pitch rotations. So basically you can synthesize the whole video into this uh, nine orientation. Uh, and I created a training set, a validation set, and a test set of the participants. They, they had access all the nine views. In training time they can train their data. <coughs> Uh, I just want to show the uh, facts coding. So this, this was the distribution, the base rates of the different action units. So you can see certain action units like AU12, that's a smile, that's very frequently occurring in the data set. Certain action units are not so much, like eyebrow movements or uh, lip corneal depressors. So for example, uh, uh, these are small in the data set, and we also did intensity coding. So you can see here the uh, intensity levels of the different action units. So we intensity coded five action units. Uh, you can see that the middle part of the intensity, those are the most prominent one. So the extreme scales, the really tiny movements and the really extreme expressions were rare in the data set. Because the question is, how do you have ground truth to synthesize it? Well, then you're just training your recognizers to recognize fake data. Which is what they will be doing. <laughs> so what we were really interested in is uh, we had the ground truth. We uh, facts coded the whole data set. And we wanted that annotation to be consistent across uh, all the views. So that's uh, one thing that is common across all the views. The if ground truth. In one view, then you just transform it to the other view, right? Uh, what do you mean? So you have a, a 3D mesh that has been you on. You just change uh, the expression there. But then you lose the ground truth information. So the ground truth was provided by a human expert. So if you want to change the expression, you have to validate if you have uh, really that valid ground truth so for the new one. So you ask animators? Say people who use Maya and raped faces and sort of move little dials. Can humans generate reasonable expressions, fake expressions? Actually, that's a really good point. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, they are using a different system. So basically, facial rigging is not facts based. So they can create really realistic expressions. Whether they can recreate like a facts based uh, expression, I think that's an open question here. Probably it's good for our next challenge. So presumably what matters there is whether they can convey a particular emotion, not necessarily the specific expression that they're... Uh, if you think about it, facts is like an alphabet. Mm -hmm. and, and emotions are words that you can build from that alphabet. But that, that's uh, it. Sorry, I, I have a colleague who very vehemently <coughs> distinguishes um, emotions from the expressions that indicate them, because that mapping is uh, is culturally um, varies by culture, at least according to her. Mm -hmm. So, for example, a smile in one culture might indicate happiness, and another embarrassment. Uh, so, I think this question goes back to Darwin. So, he set out uh, 
to answer this question whether holistic expressions are universal in different cultures. And what you can tell is uh, they are uh, occurring universally. So every culture has like happy expressions, sad, uh, contempt, and so on. The interpretation is depending on context. So for example, what you are saying, embarrassment, that's a smile. But the context is, is head movement. So when you see, when someone is breaking eye contact, turning away and smiling, that's embarrassment. That signals embarrassment. So, so that's the context. So a smile alone, you but cannot tell. Are you, are you saying that that is true culturally, uh, culturally dependently? Uh, prototypical displays can be different. For example, in, in Sri Lanka, uh, the display of disgust is different than, for example, in, in uh, Western cultures. That's why I tried to talk only about detecting expressions and not what they indicate. Yes, so we want to recognize the basic building blocks and then but these are the actions. This is the, the problem with all these tests or, what, or benchmarks. Nobody gives a damn whether I can accurately code the facial things because that, that doesn't have anything to do with any task I could possibly care about. I want to know, you know, I want to either be able to predict future behavior of a human being or, you know, see how happy they are. I don't care that their eyebrow is raised 5A. Mm -hmm. It makes no difference to me. And, it, it, you know, it matters immensely what space you measure performance in, in terms of are we getting something that's actually useful. Mm -hmm. it, 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 if you wanted to match pixels, the dominant uh, features would be head pose. None of this other stuff would matter much. But, you know, is head pose a useful thing to be able to accurately measure? Well, I don't yeah. know. Uh, something that you miss there is the interpretability. You can interpret it if you are first estimating action units, and then you can build it to holistic expressions. So you can interpret what is happening on the face. You can train an end-to-end black box system, but you are missing what's happening inside. Yeah, I share the skepticism about that. So when I was living in Japan and working in a, basically with, with people who did facial coding, they did psychophysics on me, and they showed me a bunch of Western expressions. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I said, is that angry? <coughs> Then they showed me a bunch of Japanese expressions. I hope I don't offend anyone. But basically all the Japanese expressions were angry. And I said, they're all angry. And they said, no, no, this is sad, that's disgusted, you know, this is happy. So something very different is going on across cultures and probably at a much smaller scale as well. That's why you need elicitation. So if you can elicit those expressions, you will get a genuine one. So probably they were posed expressions. I mean, I'm not familiar with that study. Chris, back in the analogy, nobody really cares what your body temperature is. They care whether you're sick. Well, also speech recognition. You know, different languages use different sets of phonemes. I don't really care what the list of phonemes is. I want to know what the message is. Mm -hmm. If you worked on speech recognition, you would care. <coughs> <laughs> so several uh, teams accepted this uh, challenge. I uh, plotted the performance of the uh, best four plus the baseline result. So this is a F1 measure on the binary task. Uh, so you can see there's still room for improvement, but uh, the in interesting thing here is the first three, these are deep learning based methods. Uh, the third one is a, a shallow learner but their performance on the, intensi uh, on the binary task is relatively similar. But you can see a really big difference in the intensity, the really fine scale uh, estimation. The first two uh, is a deep learning based method, the third one is a shallow method, and you can see the difference is more than 10%. So what you can say is the precision is improving slowly, uh, deep uh, CNN still winning precision here, it's more than 10 or 15 percent higher than a shallow methods. But the question is, what is human precision? So if you take a human annotator, uh, annotate, double code a portion of that data set, what is their precision? That's what we did for both for binary and intensity annotation. 
Uh, these are free marginal kappa measurements uh, that normalizes uh, the prediction to a chance level. So zero is chance agreement, uh, one is perfect prediction. So what you see here is a manual annotator can get uh, really high reliability with another uh, coder. It's everything is nearly over 0.8, so 80% agree. What is AU14? AU14, that's a dimpler. Uh, you, can, you can say uh, that's a, a smirk when you're pulling the lip corner to the side. Usually it's a unilateral movement. In, in this evaluation, uh, do you get credit only if you get the exact same of the five levels? Yes, that's a frame level. Frame level, so they have to get it right every frame. Okay. So, of course, these are highly trained people. They are doing that for five years every day. So naive raters can do uh, this, cannot reach this line uh, kind of precision. So there's a lot of room for improvement. Uh, another open question here is, is really domain transfer. So if you train on, uh, on one data set and you want to transfer uh, your classifier, you want to apply your classifier on another one, that still fails. And another question is how you collect in the, well, in the wild expression data. If you want to use feature length movies, those are the best fix miles out there that you can see. That's, uh, that's also a problem. Maybe you should only use the one that won Oscars for best actors. Probably those are the best fakes. And I think there are other factors that would predict who won the Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> and just to show your application, <coughs> uh, I want to show how uh, this uh, system can be used uh, for deep uh, brain uh, uh, systems, how to regularize them. So we have a project for an obsessive compulsive disorder. So a person with OCD has obsessive thoughts, uncontrollable reoccurring thoughts, and uh, behaviors, compulsions, uh, that she feels to repeat over and over again. So for example, when you leave your home, you might have a thought, oh, did I close the gas? And uh, to relieve that anxi anxiety, you can go back, check on the gas, uh, and that's relieved that anxiety. So a person with OCD, they have to repeat this action hundreds or thousand times over before they can leave their house. So it can be uh, a very disabling uh, disease. <clears throat> and 25% of the patients fails to respond either cognitive behavior uh, therapy or antidepressants like Prozac. And DBS to the ventral straight, uh, stratum uh, shows to be improvement in 60% of the cases. So the ventral... DBS is a TLA. What's that? DBS is a TLA. DBS? TLA is a three-letter acronym. Okay. What is DBS? DBS is deep brain stimulation. So this is a system that basically uh, they are implanting an electrode like three inches deep in your brain. So you can think about it, it's like a pacemaker, but for your brain. It can measure and uh, stimulate uh, brain activities. It's a very uh, intrusive uh, technique. So, wait a second. CBT and SSRI uh, show benefit in 75% of the cases. Yes, CBT is cognitive. The 25% for whom they fail? Yes. Okay. So the 25% of the patients fail to respond, so they have treatment resistance, OCD. And uh, the ventral stratum is part of the basal ganglia. That's part of your reward circuit. So that's the region that gets uh, out of control uh, if they have uh, OCD. They don't have to walk around with the needles in their heads. Just doing this now and then has no, benefits where, when the needles are removed. I, I will show. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so this is not a new technique. So there's a lot of open loop uh, DBS systems out there. Uh, usually they are using it for tremor, Parkinson, but uh, in case of OCD, there's no objective measurement. I mean, in tremor, you can measure the movement of the upper lip for, uh, limb, for example. It can take a really long time, uh, multiple visits, just to fine tune a system, and there's no reliable measurement. So it's more like uh, a feeling based. Uh, there's also risk of hypomania that uh, basically uh, 
the change between high levelance and low levelance states. So sometimes a person is feeling e extremely happy, and in a few seconds after, they, they are feeling depressed. So that's a serious side effect of DBS simulation. Uh, sometimes they can be ho hospitalized because of that. So adaptive DBS system looks something like this. So <clears throat> what you can see that the electrode is placed in her brain. We are also recording uh, EEG and also surface EEG, ECOG. So when they open the uh, skull, they also place a surface EEG. That's a surface on the brain, of the brain. So they can provide really precise uh, uh, EEG measurement. Uh, the stimulation unit is placed in the chest cavity. And uh, you can either stream the data to a computer, or you can just download it. Uh, and we are measuring facial expressions uh, to response to a MERT uh, response. So when uh, the doctors open the skull, place the uh, placement of the electrode, usually they turn it on, what they call uh, to elicit a MERT response. That's a really strong, positive feeling. Uh, they are using that information to get feedback whether they place the electrode at the right place or not. And uh, we are measuring the facial expressions, which is the motor, motor output of that region. And you can actually measure and quantify. We have preliminary data uh, of two patients. One of them is a 27 years old woman. So she was recorded in the OR operating room while she was awake. Uh, and prior implantation, uh, she has a, a really treatment resistant OCD that she couldn't control. And the other patient is a 23 years old man. Uh, I will show video in two conditions, whether the system is on and off. Now, a word of warning before I go to the next slide. The next slide will show a video of, uh, of the woman in the operating room. So she is lying on the operating table. Her skull is open. It's not visible. The electrodes are already placed. And the doctor will turn on the voltage up to 6 volts. It's a 6-volt stimulation to the ventral stratum. Her face is in a, what we call a stereotactic frame, so her face uh, or head cannot move. And of course, she is awake during the operation. You don't have uh, pain receptors in your brain, and it's good to have the patient to be awake. So if you, do, if you are doing something wrong, you have a, uh, immediate feedback. So what you see here is the original video, the processed video. <coughs> And uh, I'm plotting here the positive valence over time. So you will see the red uh, bar moving. And they turn it on. So it's uh, immediately, you can see that it's a full blown smile on her face. Is this the same area where you stimulated rats and they self-stimulate, they'll keep pressing the button until they start to death? The doctor is uh, doing that. So she's feeling happy. Yeah, press that button again. Yeah. <laughs> and they turn it off now. And you can see that the expression just drawn from her face immediately. And also the memory that she tried to recall, it's gone. She cannot remember that. And we can measure uh, the affective response. So that was a MERT response that you saw, and we can quantify. And she's not so happy now. Is the stimulus identical even at the end? Just, just a moment. Sorry? Uh, at the end where it tails off, has the stimulation ended? Yeah, so usually how they uh, elicit a MERT response, they turn it up to 2 volts, okay. that stimulation. They don't see anything, then turn it back down to 0, then turn it back up to either 4 or 6 volts, and that's where uh, you see the MERT response. And uh, the end, that was a cutoff immediately. So you can, you can see there's a gradual decrease but that was a, right. a complete cutoff. Nice see on that chart what the independent variable was. 
you, you can see when it starts, but it's kind of not really clear when Yes, it yes, that's true. So as we're speaking now, they are recording a new patient uh, in, in Baylor Medical School, and they are recording a time-logged uh, video, uh, EEG, and DBS measurement. Uh, so we will have that processing for the next time. So you can see that uh, you can measure uh, facial expressions and uh, the MERT response, the intensity of this uh, response to parametric variation of the stimulation. And uh, next patient, that's the male patient. <coughs> so that was a bilateral ventral stratum uh, stimulation. And this is when the uh, unit was on for like uh, a minute. So you can see he's uh, very uh, uh, positive. I'm plotting positive effect and negative effect. So it's like uh, you can see they are, he's showing much more of uh, eyebrow movement, illustrators, uh, intense smiles together with large head motions, body motions. And you can see that we get uh, all of the actions, the uh, eyebrow movements, and that transforms to a positive effect. Uh, we get very little negative effects. Uh, some of the uh, bro lowerer, that's what we got here, that can show up as a negative effect. And after that, they turn it off, and they record that the patient after three hours. So what you see here is, let me just play this. <coughs> so his behavior is completely uh, changed. He's showing a lot of uh, action in it for. There's the blower, lower uh, sadness and occasional lid tightener, eyelid tightener. So you can see that his whole attitude has changed. And we can characterize and quantify how much it's changed using positive and negative effects. So I'm sorry, he still has the... The, yes, so he has, uh, he has the implant. Okay. So they turn it on for uh, one minute, uh, and then they turn it off and record it after three hours. So you can see this uh, degradation in, in positive behavior over time. So we were seeing how long after they turned it on or, or off? So they turn it on for a minute, okay. then they turn it off, and they record that the off video uh, after three hours. So that was after okay. three hours, the old condition. So we can characterize this behavior uh, really precisely. So if you, can see, if you see that DBS produced a really uh, dramatic increase in, in positive effect, uh, in the own condition, you can see that positive effects are significantly higher than negative, and you, you can characterize how these changes. Uh, there's some limitations. We have only uh, two subjects currently, but we are getting uh, more, and we are conducting a, a longitudinal study. We are measuring them over time. So the goal is uh, really to generate, uh, to realize a closed loop system uh, that can measure and regulate behavior. And just the last component, I, I like to talk about a little bit about the synthesis part. <coughs> Yeah, just a few more slides. Uh, so if you think about computer vision techniques, all of the methods, or most of the methods are reversible. Uh, you can synthesize images from expressions. So one of the uh, applications is you can create face synthesis. If you have a lot of 2D images, a possible 3D uh, mesh, you can build a 3D avatar uh, that you can uh, use for augmenting someone's facial uh, likeness. So for example, you have a Obama impersonator. He's pretty good, but he's not Obama. You can uh, move his facial likeness closer to the real person. Also, another application of uh, synthesis is uh, de-identify video by preserving the expression. So you can see you have, uh, for example, a uh, driving video, which is in the middle. Uh, you have an avatar, you can build an avatar from the video, and you can de-identify the driving video using that person's avatar. Another application, if you don't have access to a lot of uh, videos, uh, you can animate a single frame image. 
So just to wrap it up, uh, I propose the dense, accurate, uh, model-based face tracking system that provides uh, precise measurement of facial expressions, head orientation, and eye gaze. Uh, we can use this uh, technique to reliably measure facial action unit intensities. Uh, you can, and uh, I presented a system for realizing open loop DBS systems, and you can use it for data de-identification. Uh, I have uh, multiple collaborators uh, at, from CMU. I worked with uh, Takeo on face alignment, Simon Lucille on metric 3D, Fernando with uh, component analysis, uh, and so on. Jeff Cohn is uh, my point of contact in psychology at University of Pittsburgh. And of course, Fernando is gone now to <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> uh, I have a couple of ongoing projects and funding. So one of uh, the first project that's uh, moving all this system to a mobile platform. The, basically, we want the same system to work on a cell phone that you can deploy to people's home. Uh, to uh, fund uh, two grants or multi-model interaction analysis. I want to extend this system with body and head movements, and also two grants on the DBS, the deep brain stimulation. And thank you for your attention. Any questions, comments? Go ahead. Yeah, I'm a little confused about the DBS. Is it, if I understand, you were just using the facial expression stuff as an objective measure of affect. Yes. Uh, to detect a contrast that's, you don't have to be an expert or reliable or objective to, to detect. Exactly, you want to measure the effect of the stimulation. So in, in the case of tremor, is if somebody has Parkinson, you can quantify the movements, for example. But in a disease that uh, involves the limbic circuit, in the brain, one way to measure it is to characterize the expression, facial expression and facial effect. So in the case of, of tremor, I would imagine that the degree of tremor matters. Uh, the contrast you showed us is so striking that it, it's not clear that you're getting uh, more than one bit of useful information. Uh, what do you mean? Um, it's sort of like using an elephant to fix a watch, if I can completely make a metaphor. You, you don't need something as powerful as a visual technique in that particular context. So what, other than objectivity, uh, what is it bringing to that particular project? I mean, it's a, you need to quantify. So it's like one of them is objectivity. You need a, re a repetitive measure. So if a human uh, expert tried to code it, he might uh, give different results at different time points. Uh, automated system is always consistent. It will give the same measurement, the same estimation over time. So the interesting thing is uh, it's a longitudinal study to measure a response to different treatment, whether the symptoms are abating or improving, you want to answer this question, and you can quantify it. But it's more to the story, right? So this is, this is a story where you're using this to do measurement, to understand how the treatment works. Yes. But I thought you said you wanted to go much further than that. You want to have a more closed loop system, right? Yes. That so that's a... Uh, just the control of the system. Exactly. Based on the facial expression. But if your that's problem it. is hand washing, who cares what your facial expression is? That's why we need the OCD a behaviors are not facial expression behaviors. Oh, that's, <coughs> yeah, that's a medical problem. This is under the assumption mm -hmm. that there's a relationship. Between yeah. assuming that. That's a medical problem. Right. I would argue that a behavior tracking approach that looked at your whole body would be much more useful yeah. in a close Exactly. Case. And we have an administrative supplement to look into that. Well, I'll rewind it. The deep brain simulation, is that to have a long-term effect on the patient if I correctly execute it once? Or is the idea that they would have it running a like, more gentle, more calibrated level for a long period of time? And that's why we want nice. It would be a long period of time, but we right. really need to identify when uh, you need to turn on the unit right. it's, uh, to save battery life. And you don't need to regulate uh, behavior all the time. So I think the one way to look at this was we not person or expert in your center. So is the, uh, you know, we have to trust the medical field to say that facial expression is, is a signal that is useful. 
I mean, that's the motor output of that region. The broader picture is that this is useful in any medical application for which facial expression and inferred internal state is relevant to the condition of the study. Well, just to give you a concrete example, my mother has an implanted spinal stimulator and chronic pain. So I can hold an iPhone and stimulate her and she does it absolutely fine. But, you know, her self-report on whether she's feeling pain or not is really all over the place. and has to do with what happened that day and how tired she is. So if you could get a reasonable mem measure of pain, then we could set the stimulator correctly. Right. Which right now we're just guessing. Exactly. So it can provide the objective measurement. But I'm, I'm dubious. Pain is really hard to accurately track. Yeah, the display of pain that you can measure. I mean, everyone has different threshold. Right, but if I can distract my mother, uh, then you know, she'll be totally happy with the same level of pain. So, so I, have, I, have, I have a question. So um, I know when, when giving these kind of like job talks, it's, it's kind of hard to go into the technical details just because of the, the time constraint. Um, so I think I really appreciate like the applications, the problems that you're addressing. Um, I was wondering, you know, out of the different methods that you developed and use, like what do you think might be the, the strongest like technical contribution? Maybe from the you know, uh, machine learning point of view or a computer vision point of view? And is there like a, a, a theoretical or a technical kind of approach that you want to keep working on a press more. Right, right. Yeah, I was going to ask a similar question. <laughs> so I'll elaborate on that one just to add one point. Uh, you know, there's been research on those facts and all that for a long time. Mm -hmm. Here back to me, a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so, so <coughs> you know, building up on, on this question, you know, what do you think are the key technical things that you contribute mm -hmm. and that more generally Right, right. So what I contributed is the dense 3D tracking that it's possible in real time. So you can implement that system in a in an iPhone or in a really low power consumption system. It works in real time, provides a really precise measurement of the facial movement and the head orientation and also the eye gaze. So that's one of the uh, key contribution. And the other uh, is the action unit estimator. So basically, that's a deep learning system that can provide a precise estimation of the intensities. On is the this, um, I mean, is this component probably independent of all the application, or are you interested in trying to understand the application and then integrate it with that? Or are you just saying, you know, I'm, I'm going to build my tracker in my room, and I'm going to give it off to Jeff Cole, and he's going to do deep brain simulation. <laughs> that the case or is there some way of you know informing your research based on some of these diverse applications so there's a feedback so all of these systems are trained on a population however for example in the deep brain stimulation we don't have a lot of data but uh, from different subjects we have data from one person over time so you need to adopt these systems so that's an open question how you can adopt a system that was trained on a population to a single person. So that's an open question. That's domain transfer here. Adapting the, the uh, fast detection or adapting the, the DBS? Uh, the detection. The, so the DBS stimulation will based on the detection of facial effect. So sort of analogy. So if what you're improving is the expression uh, recognition that's sort of analogous to speaker adaptive speech recognition. Right. Okay. Exactly. So if you want to adapt the system to an unseen person, that's the way to go. Any other questions? Yeah. I'd like to know why this isn't more like speech recognition. Why aren't I hearing about HMMs and things like that? Uh, so, for example, you can use HMMs for modeling the dynamics of expression. Right. I mean, these days people are using uh, deep nets 
and LSTMs, for example, recurrent networks, uh, those are more popular. Right. Okay. Because their face is on the outside and their speech production apparatus is mostly on the inside. No, I would argue that, that they're very similar systems, probably <coughs> by very similar brain systems. Your vocal cords are a set of muscles, or controlled by a set of muscles, and your face is controlled by a set of muscles. And you probably drive them in very similar ways. Yeah, you can so, use the same so the system. the notion of gesture should be the same across your face and speech. And you can utilize HMMs, for example, on, on this kind of data. But other techniques work better, like the deep net uh, based That's methods. So disappointing. <laughs> well, I mean, I spent the last half decade just to tweak the detectors to respond pixel values, and these days you can just pour all the data into a deep learning system and you get better results. On that note, any other questions? Go ahead. Technically, it's the same question. Uh, do you want to say a little bit more since one of your contributions? Is the uh, adaptation, um, can you say, tell us a little bit about, uh, I guess, the method and, and results? So I haven't done adaptation yet. That's an open question. Uh, so all of these systems were trained on a population, and you hope that uh, the, uh, the subject that you are trying to test uh, will fit uh, well in that population. If not, then you can either adopt the features that you're extracting, or you uh, probably can adopt the whole system. So for example, select people from your training set who are the closest to the new person and retrain the system or adopt it that way. So that's where ongoing current work? Yes, that's the current work. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.